It's um, it's a Saturday. It's the Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina podcast, and actually, uh, we will most probably put this on YouTube. Right, scene setter. Some time ago, uh, I got this contact from this guy that says, "My name is Arch, and I'm in Dayton." And then he said, "Yes, that Dayton." Uh, for those that don't know anything about Bosnia Herzegovina and its link uh, with Dayton, we will find out in just a minute. Um, so I was a guest on Arch's podcast. Arch, by the way, is the other guy um, on the screen at the moment. It is at the moment 20 past three in the afternoon with me. Miserable, chilly. The typical Bosnian spring hasn't even got out of bed yet. Um, so the first question, Arch, in Dayton, Ohio, it's 9.20 in the morning. You're having your first coffee, I take it. What's it like in Dayton today? Uh, you know, it's been, uh, there's a bit of a chill, but spring's definitely here. So you can, we've got some flowers coming up in the backyard and uh, the rhubarb that we had planted last year is, is up again. So there's, you know, there's signs of spring, but it's, it's a little chilly. Right. That's the niceties out of the way. Good. Arch Grieve, I know as much about you from the short chat we had together on your podcast. Uh, I have trolled, not trolled, I have researched you online. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't know where to start. So here we go. Arch Grieve, who is he? What is he all about? Oh man, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> it might be too early for me to be existential, but uh, I, uh, I guess I'm, uh, um, you know, I'm a, a husband, um, and then I'm uh, a mediator. Um, so I work for the city of Dayton as a mediator, and um, um, and I manage a grant program actually that has to do with Bosnia Herzegovina that hopefully we can talk about at some point, um, and. Um, you know, I I don't know. I, I have a lot of different interests. Um, I uh, uh, I enjoy building things and playing music, bird watching. Um, so I you know it's hard for me to answer that question because it feels like it's always in flux. So I uh, I just enjoy learning and, and doing new things. And um, uh, so yeah, I guess that's that's a little bit about me. For those that are seeing this uh, in video format, and I'll try and get. Uh, arch to paint a picture for for those who are, who will just be consuming this audio wise you are sat as far as i am aware in a tiny home is that right or is that is that your cabin office you've been making creating video <laughs> creating videos about making tiny homes right down to doing uh, maple syrup is it so this is not a normal office where you are today is it or is it no. Well, I mean, so during the pandemic, um, I was put on temporary emergency leave by the city. And um, I've always loved tiny houses. Um, so I kind of wanted to do my homage or my version of a tiny house office in my backyard. And so that's where I'm sitting right now. And, you know, some might call it a shed, <laughs> but it does have heats. Uh, for the winter and uh, it's not insulated so that's why you might call it a shed but uh, I call it my tiny house office because uh, I you know love tiny houses and uh, it was a lot of fun to build it so much fun that I decided I was going to do another tiny house office down in uh, uh, Airbnb property that my brother and I own down in southern Ohio and we uh, hauled a bunch of lumber and stuff up this giant hill with some friends and a little kind of hunting cabin together. It's just eight by eight foot, um, but you can camp up there, you know, and um, I actually went hunting from there last year. Um, so it, it's a lot of fun and um, and I, I enjoy building them, uh, but uh, nothing too complicated or anything like that. So when I say tiny houses, some people get an idea that they're, it's, you know, this really nicely put together thing I'm, I'm just kind of building maybe maybe they should be called relax checks i've heard that term before so that's that's kind of what i'm building i followed i followed the build on youtube and i have to say i was um quite captivated by it by it all it seemed just like i don't know this might ring weird for somebody in the united states but it's like i i got a 21st century buzz of being a frontiersman again would you agree with that 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I'm glad you did. That's kind of what I was uh, going for a little bit. So, uh, yeah. and the maple syrup thing. Yeah, I forgot you met, you asked about that. And there are maple trees down on that property as well. And so my grandpa, you know, we actually bought the property from my grandparents and been in the family for 30 plus years. And he'd really gotten into making maple syrup the last 10 years or so. So uh, he helped me through that process. And it turned out really great. We actually got quite a bit of maple syrup and I uh, enjoy, I enjoyed the process for sure. Not only do you do YouTube, I'm, I'm trying to paint this picture of Archgrieve because what you do as a mediator is, is hugely serious uh, and is very relevant, especially to a lot of things that happen in the 21st century. Um, I, I'm not going to insult you at all, but you're not the youngest of guys. Why are you on TikTok as well? <laughs> I just like enjoy TikTok. I, I don't know why. I, uh, uh, I got into it. Uh, someone told me actually that I should do it to try to promote my YouTube channel. And um, I, I thought, okay, I'll give that a shot. And now it's just become whatever I'm interested in. So there's no, no niche at all to it. But um, I, uh, I do enjoy uh, just watching TikTok videos and making content. So. Is it difficult to make content for a TikTok video channel? Mm. Yes, I think so. Uh, just coming up with ideas that people are going to find entertaining, especially just because of how condensed the format is. You know, it's, you get 60 seconds at most. So um, I, I actually started a, a work account for um, mediation and I'm struggling with content ideas. Uh, so it, it, it takes a lot. Well, let's, let, let's quickly trot on now to being a mediator. Uh, First of all, mediation means a lot, doesn't it? I mean, there's, for me, when you say somebody's mediating, I don't know why, but I, I gravitate to failed marriages, you know, to people that are in that sort of domestic um, uh, turmoil, as it will. But sure. what, 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 is, what is a mediator actually? And what is the scope for people like you who are, very professional trained mediators um well so i mean a mediation is just simply you know a, a conversation with two or more parties where a neutral party is there to help them try to communicate more effectively and that's kind of how we view our role is um and and you know there it's hard to talk about it without acknowledging that there are different styles of mediation and i practice what's called transformative mediation but you know, there's evaluative, there's facilitative, um, there's some different styles out there. Our style in particular is very non-directive. So what we're actually doing in the room uh, is, you know, a lot of uh, reflecting what people say and summarizing where they're at, checking in with them, um, you know, helping them um, maybe answer questions for themselves about the process, you know, um, and how it's going so but we do all types of different cases i actually manage our divorce and dissolution program so you're exactly right um a lot of times people will use it to end their marriage um sometimes though you know we have um family disputes family mediations um we have um i do the small claims program so i go over to court and mediate um so there's really all different types of um you know, mediation uh, out there uh, that, you know, pretty much any kind of dispute you can think of, there's probably somebody that's tried to mediate it. How did that training, how did that professional life or the professional life that you have, how did that bring you to the corner of the world where, where I'm living at the moment? Well, you know, it's funny, actually. Um, I took a trip uh, to Bosnia-Herzegovina in... Um, I want to say it would have been 2015 or 16. And um, it was a part of the Dayton Sister Cities uh, trip. They went on a delegation trip there. And on that trip were two people who worked at the mediation center and who still do. Uh, one's now my boss and the other is a good friend and colleague. And um, I, you know, kind of got started um, by they convinced me, hey, you should really be a volunteer because we're actually a community mediation center where we 
train volunteers to do a lot of our mediations. And so I said, okay, so I was a volunteer for um, about a year or two. And then um, they actually had a position open up and I was looking for a career change and thought this is something I think I'd like to do. So I applied and got it. And I've um, you know been mediating now for about three years professionally. Um, so yeah, it's um, really Bosnia Herzegovina kind of changed my life and changed the trajectory of my career just because of who I went on a trip there with. So it's pretty cool about that. What were your preconceptions? Did you have any preconceptions when they said, hey, we're going off to Bosnia and Herzegovina? In other words, did the country really feature in, in your life in any way at all? I know, yes, you know, about the Dayton peace accord where they brought the uh, warring factions together to, to, to stop the awfulness uh, in the area. But what were the preconceptions and if any, and when you landed here, when you arrived here, how did that match up with the reality that you were faced with? Um, well, I, you know, so I, of course, I'd been a teacher and I, I taught about, you know, the conflict and things. And so I didn't really, though, know what life was really like there. So we always like to do our research, everything from Rick Steves to reading books and um and there was a good guidebook that I had found. Um, and I guess one thing that uh, was maybe told to me that seemed like it, it kind of pans out, maybe you'll disagree, I don't know, but um, they kind of described the country almost as uh, Middle East meets Germany to some extent. And that kind of seems like it, it resonates. Uh, and, it, it, you know, like I would, I'm thinking about going uh, to Sarajevo and going to the to the brewery there. And it seems like you're in a German beer hall and, and everything. And then you walk across the street and have hookah, you know, at a bar. And uh, so it's it's all kind of, it, it seems that that's kind of how I describe it to people sometimes. Um, but I didn't know what that experience was either because I'd never been to either of those places. So <laughs> that it was... Uh, you know, kind of based off of preconceptions I have of other places. But um, but then, you know, there's just so much more to the country. And I, I love visiting. I've been back now, I think, uh, four or five times um, because of some of the exchange work that I've been doing. So I can never, I can, I'm always looking forward to my next trip there and trying to figure out how am I going to get back. What were the reactions to to you from the locals that you met? And I say that, and because most of the people that I, I, I meet, foreigners, the first thing they say, I said, you know, what, what was it like your first few hours or whatever, the first meeting that you had? And they almost come back with the same answer, slight variations on a theme. But what the f are you doing coming here when there's a lot of other places to go? <laughs> I definitely got that a lot. Yeah. Um which I don't understand because it's such a beautiful country, you know, and the, the people are amazing. The, the food is to die for. I love the food there. Um, so that's, that's one thing I don't want, especially given the fact that, you know, it's um, the, uh, the cost of so many things is so much cheaper than a lot of other vacation destinations you might go. So you, you're, I, you feel like you're getting all this, amazing stuff for a steal um so that that's one of the things i don't understand uh that people react to because i i think that the uh you know everyone should be going there i, I recommend everybody uh that should be your next trip so um but i also would get the um of course uh <laughs> being from dayton and you know uh, basically having their constitution named after us, then we uh, would go there and I'd say, yeah, hi, I'm Arch. And then they'd inevitably ask, where are you from? And I would say, I'm from Dayton, Ohio in the U.S. And then they would kind of look at me weird and they would go, Dayton? And I'd say, yep, yeah, that Dayton. <laughs> so, uh, and I kind of got into this habit where uh, um, I would apologize because I know that sometimes maybe Dayton, I, our goal is to kind of, you know, raise the... Uh, the profile of, of the city of Dayton itself, because there's a lot of people here in Dayton that um, really are strongly tied to the country. And, uh, you know, we we want that connection to be strong because we're friends, we're sister cities. So, yeah. You know, when you when you were when you first came here um, and 
mediating? What sort of mediating? Or was it just a, um, a, a familiarization visit so you can take back information to people back in your home city, the sister city, if you will? Well, um, I'll be honest, I was not, um, I wasn't actually a mediator yet. I was a teacher um, at the time, um, but I was, at the time I was on the executive committee for the sister city committee. And so um, got to go on that trip and um, really it was more like familiarization and then trying to figure out what are some, we had some things we wanted to come out of the trip. And, you know, one of those was trying to figure out maybe some strategic partnerships we could make. And I actually ended up um, uh, starting a student exchange program at the school that I worked at. And so, um, and part of that was because I said, I really wanted to figure out how am I gonna get back here? So uh, taking students seemed like a great way to do that. And um, so I took students over there two times and then um, partnered with um, a, uh, an organization called Interra Technology Park in Mostar and they um, helped manage the uh, um, the uh, BIH side of the exchange and bringing students uh, over here to Dayton. So we did that twice. And then um, when I got my new job, uh, we applied for a State Department grant um, through the U.S. Embassy in, in Sarajevo, and we actually received that. So now I manage this grant program that brings over 18 students and three teachers um, from the country. And... Um, this will be the second time we've done that. COVID obviously uh, made it impossible last year, but we're hopeful for September being um, when we can actually do it the next time. You're aware as I am, and yeah, well, I am definitely aware of it. Um, the country is still not healed. Uh, we're what, 26, 27 years or whatever it is now. Um, after they stop fighting and there it seems to me at times that the divisions rather than getting less or you know that they're just becoming more and more deeply entrenched so a two-part question for you now arch one do you see it like that and what would you say in your in your opinion is the likelihood of success that we we could ever get these three ethnic groups to to get on in in, a, in an acceptable way in the future. Oh, that's a great question, um, and I, you know, there's part of me that does see it like that, and obviously, I, you know, I would defer to your expertise as someone who actually lives there, and so, um, but when I go there, I certainly see it. But what struck me, I guess, was that, um, you know. We, we have so many tensions here in the United States, they might not necessarily break down along the same lines, but I don't particularly see, um, uh, I, I don't see it as uh, um, incredibly worse. In fact, what surprises me sometimes is the extent to which people are having gone through that experience and, and probably not gone through a lot of, um, you know, healing and, uh, and things like that. Um, that that's almost the opposite of what struck me the most. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think though, one of the things we're going to try to do is, um, there's a, you know, transformative mediation is one thing, but then there's also transformative dialogue where you bring, you know, larger groups of people together to have conversations about, um, those types of things. And I'm really looking forward to having discussions like that, particularly with young people, because uh, these are going to be high school students. And, you know, I think that they see the country differently. Uh, they see the possibilities differently. And I have hope, I think, that uh, in the young people there, that, you know, they, many of them obviously didn't live through that. They don't have that experience. And, um, you know, when I work with them, sure, there is tension, but it's more regular high school tension uh, than it is, you know, breaking down along these ethnic lines. And so I have a lot of faith and hope, I guess, for the future based off of the young people that I get to meet. When I was when I first arrived here in full transparency, I was working with NATO um, in, the, in 1998. So that was two years after co conflict ended. And the narrative at that time was mere intolerancia, peace and tolerance and after mm -hmm. all these years i think we got it incredibly wrong 
asking somebody to tolerate each other is one thing. Asking somebody to reconcile with each other is something else. And I, 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 as the expert, I'd like, like your take on this. I actually feel that reconciliation is more important in the grand scheme of things than tolerance because I can tolerate my neighbor. I just don't have to talk to him. I don't have to look at him uh, as long, and I can ignore him, which means there's never going to be any healing between us. Whereas reconciliation is a lot more painful. I do appreciate that. Um, whether it worked in South Africa or, or not, when you see it, what's happened after the effect. But as, as an expert, what had, what do you feel is more? Is it reconciliation? Is it tolerate, tolerate uh, being tolerant? Or is it something else that maybe people here haven't even addressed yet? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, <clears throat> and I, you know, um, I, I guess for me, um, I, you know, I, I, I was just in, uh, I joined Clubhouse, another social media app <laughs> recently. And uh, there was someone in that room who was, um, uh, her name was Joe, and I'm terrible, but I cannot remember her last name. I'm going to have to, you know, she went through this experience of having her father killed by an IRA member and has, you know, basically gone on a crusade since then. She met with them, uh, you know, and had this conversation and reconciliation to the point to where they're friends now and they speak together and things like that. And um, that's incredibly hard work, you know, and, um, you know, she's actually, I, the reason I bring her up is that she mentioned uh, that she has done some work in um, BIH. And um, what she was surprised at um, was the lack of kind of that reconciliation infrastructure, I guess. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was you know, struck by that because, you know, there are, I think there is a problem, for example, with schooling, you know, when you have separate schools. And I've, I've been inspired, though, by looking at some youth who are, and I can't, not, I cannot remember where, you would probably know, but um, places where youth are standing up and saying, we don't want segregated schooling, for example, we uh, want yeah, that, to it, go to school the, together. The, the city of Yaitza has, uh, yes, yes. That, that, that was the first one where the kids stood up against the adults and against the system and said, enough is enough, you, we, we, we're going to do this together. And I think they won that argument against the adults. Yeah, and that's that's hugely inspiring to me. So I, um, that that's why, I guess, you know, the that younger generation to me gives me some hope um, that, that there are things like that. But I do think that there's an infrastructure that's needed for reconciliation and has to be, that's unfortunately something I don't think and, and as enough people are talking about um, is what what kinds of, intentional uh kinds of things that we're going to do to try to bring that about you know and um so i i don't know um what the solution is but i do see that as maybe part of the problem when you when you're taking these groups of students um across the pond to the united states uh to ohio there are they, are they from one <laughs> ethnic group or do you consciously make sure you've got a, a nice mix um to take with you to work with right you know we do definitely um and that's actually this i mean that's one of the stated goals that the state department has is to try to um you know build inter-ethnic cooperation so they're they're very explicitly choosing students who are um you know from different backgrounds um and they even want us you know to to the point of you know we don't when we assign rooms, we don't do that based off of, you know, your ethnic group. It's we're, in fact, uh, trying to mix people up so that you you meet people in the country that you may not have met, you know, just living there. So that is one of the goals that we have for sure. I remember um, uh, a colleague of mine from many, many years ago, and, and um, I like to see if it happens to you. Um, they were taking officers back to Britain. Uh, they were starting to form a, a singular army at that time, but they were guys that had been in, you know, the three different armies that were fighting at the time. Uh, and he said, we went to split the airport before they flew out on a, mil a British military aircraft to the United Kingdom. And he said, you know what, they, they wouldn't sit together. And then we put them on the aircraft and, and they just uh, on this transport aircraft and they would not talk to each other. And then... Uh, when we landed for refuel, 
all of a sudden he said, I realized that they were offering each other cigarettes. Uh, they were buying each other coffee. They were having, you know, they were really getting on. And then, you know, his, his fear of having this uh, tension during the training that they had in Britain, he said it was nothing. It was just like fantastic. It, it exceeded all his expectations. He said on the way back, David, we refueled. It was great. Then as we banked over the Croatian coast to land, they went straight back as they were. When we landed, they wouldn't look at each other, talk to each other or whatever. And he said, and that really caused him a, a lot of disappointment. I take it that when these kids arrive in land in, in Dayton, first of all, it's yippee, we're in the United States. We're going to do a McDonald's. We're going to do all the things that Balkan kids don't do. Do they get on? And then when you see them go back, that they they sort of like get back into the little snail shells again? You know, I, I think they do to some extent, but it's, I think, partly just a function of where people live, you know, right? Um, because, and, and that was another one of those things for me that kind of hit home where, you know, when you travel, you kind of realize what your own hypocrisies are back in your own country. And for me, that was another one of those because, you know, we're going over there and wanting to promote interethnic dialogue, for example, and yet I live in Dayton, which is one of the most segregated cities still, and, you know, it's 2021, and we're still largely divided um, by race, um, you know, in terms of the east side and the west side of the city, and so, you know, it's hard for me to expect more of the, this other country, particularly having gone through such a traumatic experience when we're still struggling with some of the very same things. We just call it different things here in the United States. And so um, I did, though, see a lot of, uh, you know, th there's, I, I think one of the, the bright spots, I guess, is social media has helped in that regard, um, you know, because we still keep in touch. And, you know, we have a Facebook group where everyone can talk. And, um, you know, that that really helps, I think, um, uh, make up for the fact that people might not see each other in everyday life but um but yeah I, I i have seen that but it does seem to be less pronounced for um for for the younger students i guess you have this uh, mediation or you have this project now um here in bih what what how are you rolling it out i mean is, is it starting with just small group sessions and uh, and capacity building it out how's how's it going because it seems to me from my, and I, yeah, I, I don't mix with it all the time, but there's less and less and less help coming in for the, the next generation, the future of this country. A lot of, organi a lot of countries actually, are, I think, have just given up on it. So it's, it's, very, it, it's very refreshing, you know, when, when, when I bump into somebody like you that says, hey, no, I've, I've got this and, you know, we're going to go on with it. I'm thinking, you know, there's, there's energy coming back into the country. So... How's, what's the plan for rolling this out from where you've started and where you where you hope to go, Arch? Um, well, you know, there's a part of me that's just, uh, <laughs> I am a grant manager, basically. So I'm just trying to meet all, you know, cross all the T's, dot all the I's of the grant. Um, uh, and it is sponsored, you know, by the U.S. State Department because they believe in these kinds of programs. But um, the the goal really is it's a leadership program and so we want to turn out leaders who are going to be able to go back and impact their communities and so um, i'm really excited there was a, a group in sarajevo um, that actually started their own uh, tedx youth and so there's now a tedx youth in sarajevo because of the students that came to dayton and they actually saw a tedx conference here and they thought we can do this we can put it on and they've done an amazing job they've they got the license and everything from tedx to um, you know, hold that program and, um, you know, they're inspiring new people to tell their stories and share. And so um, I can't, it's hard to predict what it's going to look like because we just try to equip them with the tools to make change, but we don't tell them what kind of change to make. And so um, that's kind of the exciting part for me is seeing what they come up with, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think that's really cool. What you've just said is it's not for me to tell them what to do. It's I, I'm just going to guide them. Um, in the early days when I was here, I, I, I just used to shudder 
especially from the Brits who were saying, you know, you're, what you're doing is absolutely wrong and this is the right way to do it. And I used to, and I used to think, my goodness, is this the pot calling the kettle black here? Because, you know, of all the huge problems that we have in the United Kingdom and you're telling them how to do things and we can't even do it ourselves. I thought that was uh, a bit rich. Do you provide them with, um, I know this is a business phrase, aftercare? Well, so we do, uh, that's something we could improve for sure, but we do try to follow up with them. And, you know, one of the things that's the required by the grant is a reporting period. And, um, you know, COVID, of course, as it did with everything else, it messed that up too, because we were supposed to go back and I was supposed to be able to travel there, uh, meet with the students and their families and um, find out what they did and then create the report. But unfortunately it just turned into a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and so um, had everybody, you know, explaining what they had been working on and everything. And, and a lot of the students projects too have been affected by COVID because a lot of them wanted to do something bringing a large groups of people together and obviously you can't do that so um so that's really um affected the way i would like to provide the kind of aftercare that we should be providing unfortunately when you get back you'll have when you come here again which i don't know maybe september I, we, we're, we're having huge problems at the moment uh i i luckily can you believe this i'm a foreigner and i got my vaccine before locals not because i'm anybody special is that the, where I am in the north of the country, uh, people are more, how would you say, they're looking to the Russian vaccine rather than anybody else's vaccine. Once again, politics and ethnicity playing into a health scenario, if you will. And I had a telephone right. call and they said, you're a Brit, right? Yeah. Would you like the British vaccine? And I went, it's a no brainer. Not because it's British, because to me, a vaccine is a vaccine. And I'd like to stay healthy very much indeed. So, um, yeah, whether whether we get to the point, which I hope we will, that September uh, people c can come back when you get when you do come back, it's, it can't all be work. There'll be time to socialize. There'll be time for Arch to uh, broaden uh, his already um, boundaries of what he knows about Bosnia Herzegovina. So far, in all the times you've been here, favorite favorite two places and why? Oh man, this is where I get into trouble. <laughs> of course, I am uh, now. I'm I'm chair of the sister city committee now, and our sister city is Sarajevo. But we've been throughout the country, and I will say Sarajevo. I, I'm glad you gave me two. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but I uh, uh, I love going to Sarajevo, uh, especially the old city there, um, and. Um, you know, I think it's beautiful, um, and uh, I, I just love the culture and, and, you know, just being able to see all the, the different sites and things. And um, so that, that's that been a lot of fun. Um, I really, really like um, the old city of Mostar as well. Uh, that's, you know, one of my favorite places to go. I, there's a little, uh, and I can be really super specific, there's the Karma Cafe that's like right underneath the bridge there. Uh, that, that's kind of my go-to spot whenever I'm in Mostar. I just like to go hang out down there, have drinks, watch the divers, uh, you know, people watch, see all the tourists and everything. Of course, I'm one of them, but, uh, you know, I, I just enjoy that quite a bit. But, um, you know, there's, and I'm, I'm terrible with names. There's so many more different plate you know i love going to kravitsa waterfall and and things like uh there's just so much natural beauty there in the country that um i could go on and on uh i won't remember all the names but that's why i started a travel blog so that i could remember things where i went <laughs> and um favorite food it's got to be meat. It's, it's, tough. Gotta, it's, it's gotta be meat right oh yeah it is uh and uh it's it's a toss-up between uh, Chivapchichi and Boric, probably. Um, I, I love Boric, and that's that's one of my favorites. But I also love uh, Chivap, so I I don't know. It's between those two, but so many different ones uh, that I love too. So pretty much anything people put in front of me over there, I, I love. So yeah, the Chivap is um is a big thing. As soon as uh, as soon as I can get out and about again, 
which I'm hoping, as I say, will be the end of this month. Tamara and I are going to go out um, for a, a day trip. Well, most probably overnight in Sarajevo. Um, but we're going to do a Chivap tour in two days oh. of Bosnia, which means that my... I'm trying to get this waistline down, right? But I mean, obviously, I'm going to explode again. Because <laughs> every city, every large town has its own twist on the Chivap. And I don't think uh, people actually uh, within the country appreciate too much about how many twists. Obviously, Sarajevo has its Chivap Chichi. Travnik has its famous one where it's soaked in broth. And Banyaluka is, is the home of the Banyaluka Chivap, which is the four fingers into a pate uh, of its own. But there are other distinct differences, and we're going to try and uh, find these. Um, but the good news is, for people listening and people watching, is if you are of a vegan or vegetarian persuasion, all is not lost. The country is actually starting to embrace it. It's not a big percentage, but I think in every city now you can actually find somewhere uh, which is not meat. Because as, I, as you all know, you go to a restaurant, would you like some meat, sir? Yeah, would you like a portion of meat as a side order of that? Yeah, and would you like some more meat with the meat? I mean, for non-meat eaters, this could be a bit of a nightmare a, a nightmare visit, couldn't it? Oh, yeah, the big things I, I warned, you know, I was, I, when I was taking students over there, I, uh, I told them all, you know, just be aware, it is a meat-eating country. Uh, if you're a vegetarian, it's, it's, you know, like you said, you'll be able to find things. But, uh, but the expectation is you're going to eat meat. So you'll, you'll, you'll have to let people know that. Now, when you come back, um, hopefully at the end of this year, um, you've, 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 you've got to put seven days on top, Arch. You've got to put seven days on top because I need to get my hands on you and, and I've got to give you the local, the real away from it all tour of Bosnia, where you can actually drink fruit because, as you know, they don't eat fruit here. They distill it into alcohol. So we've got a, <laughs> we, you've, got, you've got a lot to look forward to, my dear chap. I appreciate that. I, I love any any opportunity to, to drink fruit. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, Tamara and I said, well, when Arch comes back, if he comes back at the right time of the year, then he should come with us and uh, you and I can help the locals distill this alcohol down. It's uh, it's quite it's it's quite the experience. I don't think I don't think you're allowed to do moonshine in the States. are you? we're certainly not allowed to do it in, in the United Kingdom. That was banned hundreds of years ago. But out in the boonies, is that what you call it? Out in the boonies here? There's still <laughs> every family's every family's doing it, mate. Yeah, that's uh, something I have never experienced that uh seeing people do that so i would love to do that i, I do thankfully um that's one of the benefits of doing the exchange program is i've made a lot of good friends over there and uh so i do have a nice uh bottle of uh uh moonshine uh rakia uh here in my little tiny house uh so i i haven't run out yet so i i i keep well stocked arch finally as we bring this to an end what are the plans for Arch professionally and if you don't mind sharing privately um, for this, our second year uh, at the moment of, of such an unusual life? Um, I, uh, well, professionally, you know, um, we're really hoping the students are in, uh, in September and so... I'm doing everything right now I can. To, um, we're also to be able to start at the mediation center some uh, to do some uh, actually other um, a show with our local public acts that we can put on YouTube to try to help educate people. And I'm kind of working on that committee that's responsible for putting that together. So, um, you know, uh, I'm also personally really excited. I might thankfully, or thanks in part to being uh, on the sister city committee, one of our other sister cities is uh, Monrovia, Liberia, and might actually have the opportunity to travel there later this year. So um, really looking forward to that. I've never been to Africa before, and so that would be the first time, and uh, always eager to have an opportunity to visit a new a new continent. So, um, so I'm looking forward to that possibility. Um, but uh, 
you know, I've got my vaccine. Uh, and uh, I, I, I heard a story the other day that uh, um, I, I think searches to Disney World were up 2,600 percent. So people are, are thinking about traveling again. And uh, I'm excited for that. So whatever, uh, whatever it looks like, it's probably going to involve some form of traveling. Well, we certainly hope that we're going to meet up. I'm certainly hoping uh, that we'll get a, a coffee or a beer or whatever. And I'm really excited to sit down and, and just chew the fat uh, about a, a huge number of things. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Arch Grief. He's in Dayton, Ohio, works for a media, he's a mediator. Uh, if you want to find out more about uh, Ar uh, Arch, I'm going to have links in the description to this uh video online it will be in the show notes uh to the podcast i'm also going to give him some shameless promotion as well you can see how he makes his tiny house you can see how they do the maple syrup uh and if i can find him on tiktok i'll i'll give you that and if you really want to find out something interesting in life please do subscribe to him I, you will not be disappointed at all arch thank you very much for giving me your time on the weekend i hope you have a very safe weekend and uh, I'll catch you again very, very soon. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been great talking to you, and I love watching all of your videos and getting your newsletters and stuff. So thanks for all you do to, uh, you know, just raise the profile of the country and help it connect with new audiences. So I appreciate it.